And just thinking, okay, all I've done since Thursday is prepare different messages. I can't preach five in one day. Well, I could, but you know, eventually you would leave. I just feel that nature would call or your stomach would, you know, call. Something would happen, you would leave. So I'm looking at them, and, and I just felt that I had to go into the, my emails to look at what Chris had picked out for this week for our worship. And as I read through the worship songs, I realized what God was doing. It was like a light bulb that just kind of went off. And I saw how each thing I was studying applied to the songs that we're going to sing. And we have a very flexible uh, group of people around here because Rebecca and Chris and our singers all changed what the plan was so that I can kind of preach in between our worship songs today. And so this isn't the normal Sunday, but I do believe it's going to be a very special Sunday. And the verse I'm kind of claiming for today is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It'll be on the screen, and, uh, and we'll have opportunity for you to turn in your Bibles to other places later. But this is what it says. 
Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So that he can do more than you can imagine. We know that, don't we? I just don't know how often we're conscious of it. We want him to do something that he hasn't done. If we be honest, sometimes we're wondering about his power. Not that he has it or doesn't, but will he use it in my life? Will he do the things that I need him to do? The word of God says he can do above and beyond all that you hope and think or imagine. And the idea of hoping for it means it's something you'd like to see. Something you'd like to witness God do. But the verse ends with a real important phrase that says, The power that worketh in us. And that's talking about we who know Christ as our Savior and the Holy Spirit that is inside of us as a result. That He wants to do things in your life. This isn't like a, if you believe the Lamborghini, you can get a Lamborghini. That's not what this verse is. If God wants to give you a Lamborghini, He has no problem doing that. And if you want to let your pastor test drive it for you, that's up to you. Thank you, Lance. We just let's pack. Either way, either of us have one, the other one can drive it. I solemnly vow to you. But it, but it does mean that God is in us and the things He wants to do are incredible and are amazing. So last night I look at what felt like all these different messages and I see, no, there's one message. And so I want you to know that as they're preached today, as I cover these things, not in the full way I normally would, not a half hour for all of them, but as we cover and we go through them, I just want to encourage you to expect more. Whatever you came in expecting, expect God to do more. Believe that He has you here for a reason today. And that there is something He wants to do in your life. So with that in mind, let's go to your prayer. God Almighty, we know that You are all powerful. That all authority, all power is Yours. There is never a battle You have fought that You did not win. There's never a victory that you wanted that you weren't able to secure. And God, we know the things that are in our lives, no matter how big they seem, you are bigger. You are greater. And God, we know your word has said that when we invite you, when we humble ourselves, when we desire to be close to you, that you will draw near. So God, I pray for that this morning. That each and every one of us that is here in this building today would desire that of you. That you would do something great, something mighty in this place. We want to give you all of the time that is ahead of us in this service. Our desire is that you would be glorified and worshipped and that you would speak to us so that we can become closer to you and more like you. So God, we ask this humbly in the power of your Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we sing the next song, uh, I want to share a couple of stories with you and when I was in college, I had a friend named Larry Fiordley, Fiordelis. And when you know someone with the last name of the Orderlies, you either love them or you don't. So Larry and I were roommates for a little bit, and uh, Mr. Fiordelis, as I like to call him, would come into the communal bathroom. I don't know if you had that at your college or if you went to an up college and you had your own bathroom in your own room. I went to a college where it was like a communal area, right? All the guys had to go there, you showered there, there were sinks there, got ready in the morning there. Larry would come in every morning singing, smiling, and speaking loudly. I believe there's a verse that I used against him saying it's like, cursed are you if you raise early in the morning with a loud voice and you bless your neighbor. And he'd be like, I don't care. And he'd bless us anyway, right? So at 6 a.m. when you're brushing your like nose instead of your teeth because you're so tired. And Larry came in singing. It was a bit annoying. I'm just going to, Larry, if you're watching by any chance, own it, brother. It was annoying. So Larry took a, a second shift, kind of third shift job. He would work until like 2 in the morning sometimes. He'd still get up the next morning and come in singing and happy and he couldn't carry the tune in a bucket, but he didn't care. He was making a joyful noise. And so there's one day that, like, it was clockwork. We, that year we had the same classes. We were both in the computer area getting ready at 6 a.m. every morning and 6 a.m. is there and I'm there and Larry is at 6.05 and 6.10 and 6.15 and 6.20 and, and my mind is wondering what happened. So what did happen is that Larry was working restocking things. 
and he would use these hand pallets to move stuff. And one of the things he was moving was above the height that they were allowed to, to move. And he decided to ignore that because it was the last thing he needed to move for the night. So he got that hand truck under there and with all his force pulled that thing out and began to push it forward to where it needed to go. So he's pushing it like this. And what is below him is the, the steel handle to this thing and he's pushing it like this. There was a reason that there was a height warning, right? So he pushes it into whatever rafter was hanging low and just with all his gusto is pushing it through and that top box comes off, comes down, like he described it as 15 feet, 10, 15 feet, hits the back of his head and it just thumps into that metal thing. When Larry told me this story, there's a, five, there's a 15 minute gap from when he hits that metal stick and when he wakes up in the bathroom with a shattered, broken nose and the need for stitches. He can't recall in 15 minutes. So he goes to the hospital, he gets the stitches. I have no idea what time he got home in the middle of the night. And at 6.25, 6.30, here he comes into the bathroom. Bruised, stitched up, bleeding. He's not skipping classes. And he was singing. I looked at his face and was like, dude, it's an improvement, but what happened? You know? What in the world? And he shared his story with everyone. Larry had a spirit that you just couldn't get him down. You couldn't bring him down. Whatever went on in his life, what God was doing was a bigger deal. And he would dip like everybody does. He might take a turn for the worse. He might experience a valley. He might be a little low. He just always bounced back so quick, so fast. He would just praise God for whatever it was. I've lost contact with Larry. I haven't talked to him for several years now. But I'm just sure that wherever he is this morning, he is saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so the Bible tells us in Job chapter 1 of this man that God points out to Satan. God himself says, consider Job. You'll find this story in the book of Job. And so, and so God's like, have you thought about this servant of mine? God knew what Satan was going to do. Satan was like, yeah, he's only praising you because of the good you've done in his life. He's only going to praise you on the mountaintop. It's not easy to praise God on the mountaintop. The mountaintop might be the greatest distraction you've ever faced in your life. When things get good, we start enjoying the good. We start staring at the things. We find fulfillment in the mountaintop. So you have a distraction there, but when you're in the valley, when you're low, you're disturbed. You're bothered. You're struggling. You feel like you're alone and no one cares. So Job had lost all of his possessions, all of his wealth, all of his buildings and security and, and everything that was sheltered in him and all of his family except his wife, all of his kids. Satan removed all of that from his life in one day. And as one guy brought bad news, another guy came immediately and brought even worse. And his wife says you should curse God and die. So she wasn't a help to him. And here's his response to all of this. In Job chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. All those things that he did are his way of showing brokenness, humility. It wasn't that they didn't affect him. It was that he had made a choice that whatever comes my way, I'm not going to blame God. I'm not going to let God be bad. He's good. He's always good. The next verse says this. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The next song we're going to sing is Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. And I just want you today that whether you're on the mountaintop with distractions or in the valley and disturbed, I just want to encourage you to let this song be, be a reflection of how you view God. That in all the seasons of life, He is good. 
A day is coming where there won't be any more valleys, there won't be any more pain, there won't be any more challenges, you won't be pushing boxes and have them fall and break your nose. A day is coming where that won't happen anymore. But until that day, every day of our lives, God is worthy of our worship. Amen? So if you stand to your feet, let's sing this song out to our Lord God Almighty.
But you can liken this a little bit. You can get there a, a tiny bit if you've been a parent. Because there are times that as your kids are growing when they're little, something that is such a big deal to them is not that big of a deal to you. Because you know, you have the understanding of where they're going to be next. Yeah, they fell and they scraped their knee, but a band-aid and a popsicle is going to fix it, right? And so when you multiply that, when you make that bigger, when you talk about like chronic pain, death of a loved one, something that enters into your life that you don't want to enter into your life, when it gets bigger, we have trouble making the comparison between the two. But God does it. So he says that he will work all things together for good to those that are his, to them that belong to him. And it then becomes our job to believe it, to either trust that that is the case or decide we don't believe it. But all victory belongs to him. All glory is already his. So when he came to this earth, when he died on the cross, when he shed his blood, he finished everything that needed to be done for us. Everything we need is found in the gospel. So I have bad feet. And they can kill me sometimes. Right? What's your thing? What's the thing that's in your life that if God showed up and said, ask anything, I'll give it to you, what would you say, I want this then? I want this to change or I want this to be different. Here's my request, right? But if he came and gave you one wish and you weren't a smart aleck and wished for more wishes, there'd be the thing you'd ask and he could give it to you, right? Can I promise you that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, one day he will? My feet might stay the same way the rest of my life. I'm okay with that. If that's what God wants, I'm okay with that. Because the day will come that I'll open my eyes and I won't feel any pain at all ever again. And I'm okay that God took my mom at 57 and my dad at 61. I'm okay with that. Because the day is coming that I'll see them again. Amen. And never be parted again. Amen. And so everything that is difficult and hard and ugly about this world is solved by God and His victory and what He was able to overcome. And so we have all the past stuff that has happened and then the Bible begins to talk about future things, right? The Bible begins to, to raise Jesus to the position he should be in. And instead of the Gospels and us seeing him as someone who came and became fully man and fully suffered and fully died on the cross and, and was buried in the ground and the victory we see is the resurrection and then he's gone, right? But he said a day is coming that he's going to come back. And in that day we'll realize that every victory is in his name. Like, like his name is, is greater than your depression. His, his name is greater than your pain or your loneliness or your isolation or your sickness or your weakness or your worry or your fear. His name is greater than any of that stuff. And the Bible begins to declare this in such a fantastic way in Revelation as it begins to talk about future things. And right in the middle of this great tribulation the Bible talks about, if you're not a student of the Bible, this part will become like, what, what does the Bible say? The Bible's predicted a whole bunch of things. A whole bunch of things in the Old Testament that have already come true. And there's predictions in the New Testament that I guarantee you they're going to come true. Amen. And so in Re Revelation chapter 12, the Bible begins to describe a war that breaks out in heaven. While the great tribulation is happening on earth, a great battle happens in heaven. So let's read this together. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael, who is an archangel, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So again, just in case if you're not familiar with the Bible, Michael, an archangel, is fighting with Lucifer, the top angel who fell from grace, who wanted to be like God, who decided pride is going to rule me. And he was able to tempt, according to the Bible, a third part of the angels to follow him. And now Michael, the archangel, is fighting against Lucifer, who we know as the devil or Satan and all of his forces. That's the battle that's occurring and they're not able to overcome them. The devil 
and his army loses. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them, us, us, which accused them before God day and night. Look, before I read this next verse, can I just say, isn't that daunting to you? Satan. The Bible says this powerful being that God made that decided to become evil. Satan stands before God day and night accusing us. Can anyone in here say he doesn't have a right to do that through anything else other than Jesus Christ? I mean, without Jesus, doesn't he have a right to accuse you? Having you sinned, having you fallen, having you made mistakes? Wouldn't you run to your car in the parking lot if we were about ready to play your life up here on the screen? Maybe just the last week, every single thing you did and thought, wouldn't you still run? But this time, the accuser is cast out of heaven, and Jesus, who is making intercession for us, Jesus, who stands by the Father and in every accusation says, hey, remember what I did for them. So that accusation doesn't hold weight anymore. I paid the price for that. But if you're here and you're new to Scripture, the gospel is simple. We are all sinners and cannot save ourselves. So God sent His Son to live a sinless life and to die in the place of sinners. To shed His blood, to be buried in the ground, and to rise again to claim victory for us. So He is known as the Lamb of God as a result. Because He was willing to pay the price for you. And your only hope of heaven is through Jesus Christ. Through what He did. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto their death. The last verse says this. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and all and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. This morning isn't meant to be a lesson in eschatology, but the tribulation lasts for seven years, according to Scripture. And three and a half years will be peace. And three and a half years will be the awfulest, most terrible judgment that's ever been poured on the earth. And Satan will be here for that time. He won't be in heaven accusing us anymore. He'll be here knowing he doesn't have much more time and wrecking havoc on everyone he can. But even then, those that overcome will overcome the same way we have. It will be by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of our testimony, not about how good we are, but how great our Savior is. So when we sing this next song, when we talk about the idea of, of Jesus being the one that overcame, and this song should be the one we sing from the rafters. This should be the one we belt out with, with all our lungs. Because this is a song that is a rally cry of our salvation. Because He has overcome, we can overcome. So when you stand your feet, sing this song now to our great Savior.
as certain also as your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. So God here is appealing to an unsaved Greek crowd. And he's sharing the gospel in the way of saying, hey, he's the maker. And in him we live and we move and we have our being. Like our existence is because of him. The breath in our lungs is because he built us to breathe. You don't keep yourself alive at night, right? You fall asleep, you wake up the next morning. And I just want to say to you, isn't that a miracle? That you live all night long. And I've heard from some of the wives how some of you men snore. It is a miracle that she's still alive and hasn't killed you in your sleep. I'm just going to be honest. I heard a good joke this week. A man came home. His wife had been uh, taking care of the kids all day. And she was in a phase where she was able to be a stay-at-home mom. And he came home and he said to her, Honey, I just don't understand. You're home all day. Why is the house not clean? That is in a book. Listing what not to do. As a husband. But she was witty and smart. And she replied back, Honey, you know, I just don't know. But you're at work all day. How come we're not rich? Yeah. You know who you are. That's that's free. That's not here. That's just free for you to do what you feel led to do. You know, the Bible says in God we should find our life. And a lot of us struggle with that. We find our life in people. Like we want a person to be for us or to do for us what only God can do. Right? And you'll find it in some people because the way that comes out is they live their lives to seek the approval of other people. The choices they make, the things they do are to impress someone else. But if I could just say to you, you gain nothing when you gain their approval. Whatever you do to gain that approval, you'll have to keep doing to keep the approval. It'll never stop. And there is no reward that comes with their approval other than maybe you feel a little more secure. Instead, we should be living for God's approval. We should care what He thinks. You know, the interesting thing about that, when God chooses King David, He doesn't make the choice based on the outward appearance. The tallest one is Eliab. Eliab is big and strong and, and cut. He's a man's man. He comes up. We would have chosen Eliab. Everyone in this room, don't be too spiritual right now. You'd have looked at that dude and you'd have been like him. That's the guy. God passes over all of them because God doesn't judge by height. He judges by heart. And when David, the youngest one, comes, he's like, that's the guy. Right? So we should be seeking his approval. That's what we should need is him. Without trusting him, without realizing that, it's just easy to give weight to something that doesn't belong. It doesn't need weight. It doesn't deserve weight in your life. But we, we make it the most important thing. It's just so important to do. But what we need is God. There's also a million decisions that you're going to make in your lifetime, right? So I have some analytical in me. I don't like making decisions. I just don't. Where do you want to go to eat? I don't know. I don't care. Where do you want to go? Not there. Oh, no, no, no. They, uh, remember last time? Right. I would rather eliminate than choose. But I'm usually fine with whatever you want to say, you know? I don't care. Just I don't want to have to make the choice. But there are choices you cannot escape. You cannot live in indecision. Indecision will become a prison for you if you don't make choices. Not making choices is a choice. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't have this problem. You ever been to McDonald's and it takes you 15 minutes to order? Like, unless you're from Timbuktu, which is a real place, and it's like in Mali. But unless you're from Timbuktu, you need to get McDonald's. You don't need 15 minutes. And I'm sorry, because I may step on somebody's toe this morning with this one, but if you've been dating her for seven and a half years, and you can't figure out whether you want to put a ring on it, maybe get out of the way so that the guy that's willing to put a ring on it, you know? I'm just saying, we can, you know, we can live in such a horrible place of indecision, right? A place that that honestly puts too much weight in our own opinion and in our own thoughts. Here's the way that ends up getting carried out. We live our lives not making decisions and allowing others to do that for us 
So when God shows up and wants to do something through you, He can't. Because you won't make that choice for Him. He can do it in people all around you, but He can't do it in you because you won't make the choice to take a stand for the Lord. That's not the plan He has for us. There's nothing more frightening and nothing more exhilarating than to put your life in God's hands and say, Lord, I need you. I don't need me. I don't need everyone that's around me. My first and my greatest need is, Lord, I need you. And so that's what this next song is all about. Do you stand your feet as we sing it?
Because the greatest of things happened to me uh, when I was in the eighth grade. It was a terrible year socially for me, but spiritually it was this amazing year. I had gotten saved a few years earlier, but the church that I had gotten saved in didn't teach about the security of your salvation. And so since I grew up in a Catholic setting, I believe works really mattered with God. And if I did good works, I'd go to heaven. If I did bad works, I would go to hell. And that was the theology I had encountered. And then finally, my uncle, who was a preacher, he taught me the truth that you just receive Jesus as your Savior and you will be saved. So I received Jesus as my Savior and knew that I was forgiven of all sin. What I had done and what I would do for being a sinner, I was washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. But then I would sin and it would make me question. I'd struggle with something and wonder, can the Christian struggle with this? Is the Spirit really in me? Is He not in me? And so I doubted until the 8th grade God brought a man with a PhD in theology to the Christian school I attended and he didn't mind questions from sarcastic little 8th grade punks. They're all that. I'm not just me. If you're an 8th grader, that is who you are. Own it and then next year you'll, you'll change and start growing. No, you know what? He didn't mind. And so I asked the question, how do you guys know once you're saved, you're always saved? Why do you guys, because I wasn't a part of them guys, why do you guys say that? And he turned to passages of Scripture, shared them with me, and asked me to go figure it out for myself. And I did. The verses could not be more crystal clear. That once God saves you, according to John chapter 10 and verse 28, you are in the hand of Jesus Christ, and you will never perish. And then he says that you are in the hand of his Father in heaven. The picture of Jesus' hand wrapped around you in the Father's hand wrapped around Jesus' hand. You think you can escape that? And he says, my Father will let you go. And then to tie in the Trinity in Ephesians 4.30, it says that when we are saved, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That day of redemption is when you will receive a body that will not be capable of sin. Everything you can do will be for the glory and the honor of God Almighty. I can't wait for that day. But until that day comes, this, probably the greatest of verses on our security, needs to be in your heart and your mind. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says this, What should we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, with Jesus, also freely give us all things? That goes back to the stuff we need. Us. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Didn't we just read about someone who's trying to lay something against us? Who is in heaven and day and night accuses? And Paul, 2,000 years ago, wrote, Who can do that? Not even Lucifer. Because it is God that justifies you. It is God that makes you right with himself when you get saved. Who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Why does he need to make intercession? Because we're accused day and night. And Jesus is right there to say, no, I saved him. It's all good. I don't think he talks redneck, but if he did, that's what he would say. Next verse says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, that's a great question. And I don't know if you'd be bold enough to say this this morning, but you've asked this question, haven't you? It's something I do. May God love me less. Will he hear my prayers? Old Testament says if I regard sin in my heart, he won't. Does that mean he won't? Or under Christ, do I have an intercessor that gives me constant, free, and bold approach to the throne? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? When we struggle, when we're weak, does illness mean God doesn't love you? Does incarceration mean God doesn't love you? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
show tribulation. Or in stress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. If God somehow puts you in a position one day where you give your life for his cause, it is not evidence that he doesn't love you. It is evidence of how much he does love you. The next verse says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life Neither death nor life. Neither anything that has to do when you die or anything you do while you're alive. Nor angels. Nor principalities. Nor powers. All three of these things are talking about an invisible world we don't see. Things that are way above my pay grade and yours to understand fully. But we're promised that none of that can take away the love God has for us. Nor things present, nor things to come. I would add to it, nor things that have happened. Past, present, and future can't separate you from the love of God. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how do you know you have assurance of your salvation? Because when I got saved, I received the love of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Him yet, He would save you this moment if you asked Him. He would save you in a few moments when we have an invitation. He would save you after services if that's when you wanted to come and talk to me or someone else about it. He'd save you tonight when you're at home by yourself. If you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave, that He is the Son of God and that He is the only way for you to be saved from your sin. If you will trust Him with that, He will save you. That's a good snap. I wasn't just saying that. Should have stopped on the one. So this week, um, I was at the hospital And a brother in Christ went home to be with the Lord. Tom Kay came to our church years ago. And I'll never forget it because the very first day he was here, he almost sprinted to the altar. I don't remember anybody else being at the altar. I remember being grateful because Dave Israel came up and prayed with him. I thought he's in good hands. Whatever's going on, Dave's going to be able to deal with it and pray with him and love on him. I didn't hear anything about it. Tom was there the entire, the entire invitation. And then he got up and he left. It was his first day. Dave and I talked about it. The one thing Dave was allowed to share is that Tom uh, was worried about having cancer in his lungs. And Dave and I showed up that week to his doctor's appointment. We just sat with him in the waiting room. And he didn't know us very well, but he invited us to go back and to find out what it was. And we did that. And I just don't want to keep snapping, but like that, we were knit together. Dave and me and Tom, it was brothers. And as Tom continued to come to this church, gave his life fully back to Jesus Christ, he already knew him as a savior. He just hadn't been walking with him. He became such an amazing member of our church family. Gracious, joyful, generous, loving, pretty good nine iron. As we would play some golf together. So Tom was ill. And we talked a few weeks ago and he told me that he was taking a medicine that in 30 days he would either be cured of what was going on in him or in 30 days he would pass away. That's what the doctor told him. But some other complication arose and he went to the hospital Tuesday and then he moved, well he went to the hospital before that, but Tuesday moved to the ICU and I just felt 
like that thing when God taps you on the shoulder or whispers to you. It's always quiet, but I just knew God was saying, you need to get up there and you need to visit him. And when I got there, he wasn't in the room, but his daughter was there. She was gracious. We talked a little bit. What I heard from her is Tom was doing pretty good. They just needed to do a scan. When he came back into the room, he was talking. He was fully alive. And in just a moment, his heart stopped. And if you've been at a hospital, I know it's really hard to hear this again if you've been there and seen this happen. But there's this flood of people that come into a room when that happens. And you just kind of stand to the side and you pray and you hope. And after about an hour and a half, the doctor that was managing everybody else in the room said if it was him, he'd stop. He believed Tom wasn't there. His daughter had to make an impossible decision. She had lost her mom just two years earlier. She wasn't ready to lose her dad. But Tom was ready. He, he didn't want to. He loves his family. He's brought family to this church. People know Christ as their Savior in his family because of the day that Tom came and went and came before an altar. But here's the thing I want to share with you about, about this is that we prayed and we read scripture as he drew his last breath. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt where he is. I don't have any doubt. Tom is not a perfect person. Because guess what? There isn't him. There ain't none. That redneck's coming out again. Right? I mean, Tom isn't perfect, and I'm not perfect, and I'm not going to go to heaven because of anything that has to do with my behavior. It's going to be because of what Jesus chose to do for me. And I know Tom is in heaven because I talked to him, and he told me with the conviction that cannot be mistaken that he knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. So all of the good and all of the bad that he did is not what matters most. What matters most is that he received Jesus as his Savior. And if you receive Jesus as your Savior, then you cannot be separated from the love of God. Nothing in your death, nothing in your life, nothing in the past, nothing presently happening, nothing that you'll do in the future, nothing can separate you. Why are we so passionate about people getting saved? Because it is the decision the most important decision you'll ever make in your life and no one can make it for you. It is between you and God. But this morning I just ask you, during this next song, if you know Christ is your Savior, then the invitation will probably be you just singing at the top of your lungs. But during this next song, we just want to give an invitation. And if something about today has hit you, has tapped your shoulder, God said, hey, we need to talk, then I'd encourage you to respond. This altar is always open. You can come up here anytime you want. I think the posture of prayer sometimes matters. I get on my hands and knees, even my face at times, and pray before God, because I think it matters to Him. It's a sign of humility. But there's no magic up here. There's no magic in the pews. God's the one with all the power. And wherever He needs you to make a decision for Him, I just encourage you to make it. What a grace if He is speaking to you today. What a privilege that God Almighty would whisper something to you. And maybe it's just, it's just this truth that you're saved and you have a blessed assurance because of that salvation. If you'd stand your feet, your heads bowed, and your eyes closed just for a moment of prayer, and then we're going to sing all of us together. God Almighty, I know that in the good and the bad, you want to be praised. You're worthy of being praised. God, what an example our brother Job is. That on the worst day, maybe the worst day in history, this man said that you give and you take away Blessed is your name. God, that is a faith that is full of future hope. Would you give that to us today? And God, we know your word talks about overcoming. It talks about your power. It talks about your strength. 
Would you help us, God? May we be a people who seek to please you, who seek to, to win your approval, who do the things that you have said in your word to love others and to love you with all of our hearts, God. To mirror the truth of 1 John that if we love you, we'll obey your commandments. God, may you help us to live that life as overcomers. Father God, we need you. Every second, every step of this life. So I pray that you might speak to each and every person that is here. And however they should respond to you, you would move them to respond. That you would win victories. That we would leave this place never to be the same. God, would you work? We ask it in the power of your spirit. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you would like to sing a song with us, we'd love for you to do that. It's also just a time we want to give you an invitation. So if you want to come to the altar and pray or pray where you are, we just want to invite you to respond to God and to continue to worship Him today.
leave this place, we will praise Him all the day long. He's worthy of so much more than just this space and this time. And I hope this will just ignite the week. Let it be a week that you connect with Him, that you love on Him, that you worship Him. Because He is worthy of it. Amen? Amen. You guys want to get the lights on? Uh, just wanted to let you guys... Yeah, you can clap. Thanks. Just real quick before you go, I just want to highlight uh, the bulletin to you. I have not read it this morning, so I don't know if there's some announcements that really need to be made. But grab the bulletin, check it out, because there are some good things in there we want to make sure you're aware of. Also, in this next hour, we are having life groups uh, for all of the kid ages uh, that we do, but we're not having adult life groups. We've been looking at uh, writing and developing a new constitution, and uh, so we have done that. We believe that that work is now complete after the edits, and so we're going to have a time to go over those edits, and then also if there's any further questions. Uh, so if you're an adult, we'd love for you. Uh, to stay, to be invested in your church, to grab one of these. Let us share with you why having uh, the Constitution updated is so important. So we'd love for you to stay if you can. If not, God bless you and praise Him all the day long. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.